So hello everyone, hello and welcome again to another Saturday live stream. Micro Punter here, microscopy live stream. And uh, today I decided to do another question and answer session. Of course, uh, in the previous uh, live streams, there were always possibilities to ask questions. But uh, today I um, collected um, a few questions uh, from my YouTube channel, uh, questions that uh, some of my viewers uh, posted. And I thought some of them were quite interesting. So I decided to yeah, maybe go through them and uh, try to answer them. And of course, um, if you have a, a any questions yourself uh, in the chat please uh, please uh, yeah uh, type them in and uh, then i'm also able to address them and specifically if you have a question to, for me maybe you can put the at microbe hunter um, yeah, tag in front so that i know um, exactly that uh, you are directing um, the question to me yeah i mean just for the fun of it i've uh, <laughs> also put uh, a specimen under the microscope because uh, we do would like uh, to do a little bit of, of, of microscopy as uh, well maybe not not so much as i used to, to do because i have a few other things i want to show you as well um but uh, yeah so that's basically it sound is good uh, I'm, I'm see i see here that's uh, very nice um and uh, because yeah, sometimes the sound is a little bit um, of an issue as well. Well, uh, there is a hello from New Zealand, from New York, uh, from Northern Germany, all around the world. Okay, so I'm very happy about this. Okay, and there is already a, a, yeah a, a question or a comment. Hello, I've just uh, watched an hour um, and a half documentary about CRISPR and Cas9 and I'm really in the mood of a micro a biology session okay well CRISPR Cas9 that is uh, essentially a pretty advanced stuff this is uh, molecular biology for those of you who don't know uh, much about that in a very short uh, sentence CRISPR Cas9 technology allows you to modify the DNA in a living organism so this is um, actually quite an advanced uh, technique um, how uh, DNA can be changed inside a living cell Previously, this was not so easy. I remember when I was still at the university, this method did not exist yet. Um, this was um, um, 30 years ago, um, but a lot has uh, developed uh, over the last uh, years here. Uh, greetings from Vienna, okay, from Switzerland. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do uh, today is the following. I'm going to go back again to the desk view. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go through those um, through those um, uh, questions here a little bit and I also have uh, I brought along a couple of Barlow lenses because um, there is also a question concerning this uh, also about uh, some te technology here about uh, um, basically long working distance objectives there's a question here I don't, I, I'm going to see how far I'm able uh, to go here it's a little bit chaotic here so some uh, many of the questions are actually biology related and not so much about microscopy itself but more biology um, but I think uh, people are interested in that so um, why not uh, why not uh, talk about this okay um, however maybe you're kind of wondering a little bit um, about the thumbnail uh, what it actually shows and I'm looking now for the question over here I hope that I have it here um, yeah there is uh, some focus knobs here question and uh, yeah there are some questions about uh, whether organisms um, have feelings or not and there was actually one question and see and I actually prepared it and I don't know where it is right now but I do want to, um, there was the question was a little bit like this, whether um, copper, which is a metal, is able to kill uh, bacteria and other microorganisms. Okay, so this was kind of the question here. See, <laughs> and I've got everything here, all of those questions in exactly the most important question, the one that I wanted to start off with. Um, I somehow didn't print, it doesn't matter. Uh, the question is, is uh, can copper kill microorganisms? And I want to show you um, a nice uh, video that I made a couple of years ago this is a, a fountain uh, here and uh, this was a couple of years ago here and I want you to have an, a close look um, at the f at the f ground here there are copper coins in the um, in the fountain people throw them in I'm gonna pause the video now because I would like to show you something that I really considered quite fascinating here so here is the arrow okay um, and where's the arrow here is the arrow okay and now I can use the arrow to point and then let's have a look at a copper coin here and do you actually see that uh, it's quite green here because of algae that are growing but around the copper coin it looks white yeah it's quite quite interesting there's this there's this area around the copper coins there which is white where there are less algae growing or almost no algae growing and why is that the reason is is because uh, the copper is starting to oxidize um, and is going into solution 
basically into the water and they are basically around the copper coin this is an area where you have uh, a lot of uh, yeah ionic copper so to say okay and uh, this evidently prevents the growth of the algae I consider this quite fascinating. Um, the question is now also why exactly around here? Because the water itself uh, does not move a lot, so this basically means that by diffusion, um, each copper coin has kind of a, a kind of a, a bubble or an area of, of high copper concentration around it, and this was evidently enough to block the the, the growth of the algae. So I, I find this quite uh, quite fascinating. I know it's not directly related to um, it's not directly related now to to microscopy here, but still was a, was a very interesting, fascinating um, um, observation, right? Um, yeah, here here again. Let me pause it again here. Yeah, you can see quite nicely that. Uh, yeah, there is this area around the copper coin where the algae are not growing. Yeah. So I think uh, this is a good demonstration to answer actually yes, um, copper um, is able, uh, like other met metals, silver for example is the same, yeah, is able to bro block uh, the growth of uh, certain uh, microorganisms. Okay, yeah, so this is um, yeah, simply one of the, um, yeah, um, uh, the questions, <laughs> the first question, <laughs> which basically um, I forgot to print out. Yeah, and there's a, qu a question here. It's interesting to see that the algae aren't just avoiding the place around the coins, but also behind the coins. I assume the water moves towards the back. Yes, uh, this is uh, indeed also something that I was kind of uh, um, I was also able to realize. It tells you maybe something a little bit. Maybe it could be maybe about there's a slow water circulation because maybe the water has a different temperature depending on the sun that is able uh, yeah to strike it. And um, yeah, let's turn on the, 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 how do you call this, the arrow again. And you see that uh, in essentially behind the, 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 co uh, the copper coin here, yeah, there, um, there is, a, yeah, it's brighter and in front less. So maybe the, the water indeed is slowly circulating backwards. Yeah? Um, and I assume that the hypothesis, maybe the slow water movement could be maybe due to a water current, which uh, comes into being because of different water temperature. Yeah? So this is, uh, yeah. Um, uh, so this is uh, simply something that I wanted to show you also because this was a question uh, which was uh, yeah, posed. I'm going to now click again the, the arrow and then we can, if you, if you want to, we can um, finish uh, the video here. It's just a short clip. Yeah, uh, yeah it was a, quite a nice coincidence. Yeah, and then it's basically um, starting, uh, starting over again. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and there is another interesting comment. Uh, here there is a medicine for fish tanks. It says it contains copper and is harmful to snails in high quantities. Yeah, so this is uh, basically nothing, uh, nothing unusual. I remember a long time ago I even heard and I don't know if this is the real reason that this apparently is the reason why coins and, and my why, why door handles and so on are made of, of, of copper or other metals because it kind of blocks the growth of microorganisms to a certain extent. Yeah? So just uh, just saying. Yeah? So, uh, but what we're going to go is now we're going to go back to the desk view and a little bit, um, yeah, um, a little bit, uh, I'm just going to pull out some of those uh, those uh, things here, and uh, there is. Let me see. I have to check uh, a little bit of whether I actually have the video that I wanted to show you, because this question over here re refers to one of the questions that uh, um, of a video that I made uh, some time ago. Um, it is refers to the um, some of the. Yeah, I actually have it here, but I just realized that I forgot to link it in. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go here again and I'm going to exchange the video. Just a second, give me a short uh, time. Yeah, that's the video here. Let's see, yeah, that is Paramecium buzeria. And that's uh, essentially the one that I would like to talk about next. I made videos uh, in this channel about this, but there is a, a question um, here that I would like to share with you. And the question is the following. It looks like uh, these cells are made of smaller cells. Do you suppose those cells that are made of smaller cells and so on until the cells are too small uh, for technology to see. So essentially um, this referred to um, a video where um, actually another video but there is a little bit of a connection here. The question is, is it all of those particles and the structures that you see inside a cell, are they actually also cells and do they again contain cells? So. Um, a little bit like uh, yeah, like a, one of the, those dolls inside a doll inside a doll. If you if you know this, and the thing is here the following, um, and I say is no. Well, it depends how you see it. Uh, this here is uh, Paramecium buzeria. It is a single-celled uh, protist, 
and uh, again here I always have to switch on the arrow somehow okay so this actually here is here we go this is of course one cell okay and but those green structures that you see in there these are endosymbiotic algae okay so these are actually separate cells because they're algae which are actually also able to live um, outside of the paramecium and they have chosen to live inside the paramecium uh, because uh, basically they are protected in there and the paramecium itself again receives food that uh, those algae make and also oxygen yeah, by photosynthesis so it is called uh, symbiosis so both of them benefit and the question was now is this basically okay if the, these are cells in here and if you break them up um, and uh, then are these then again cells and so on so how far can you go and I tell you well the answer is is not so easy here generally um, it is like this that subcellular structures, which are structures inside a cell, even if they're moving around inside the cytoplasm of the cell, these are not cells because they are not able to reproduce on their own. However, here with those uh, algae, that's a different case because these are indeed cells that live in a cell. Okay? The, the cell theory in biology states that the cell is the basic unit of life. So basically you need to have at least one cell um, and every sub thing that's smaller than the cell actually is not considered alive. But what we have here again, I don't know, I'm kind of repeating myself now, is, is actually we do have algae which are cells which live inside a cell. Okay? So basically to, to answer this question here, um, and is, is uh, it looks like a cell is made of smaller cells and I say well it depends in the case of Pyramecium bizaria there are indeed other cells in there but generally not yeah um, so um, the cell actually is uh, is the basic unit here okay um, so there are again a whole bunch of questions here that I would like to to talk about here yes hello from New Jersey the United States okay uh, hello from Hungary from Washington state uh, you know one of the things I really like is that so many people around the world here uh, are gathered here greetings from Germany um, so a question here or a comment it is interesting to see that the algae are oh sorry I've already mentioned uh, talked about this my career isn't in biology, but you inspired me to take up microscopy as a hobby. And I think that's the thing that I really, thank you very much. Uh, that's the thing that I'd like to do. I would like to inspire people um, to observe nature and the environment. Yeah. Hello from the UK. Okay. Um, so this is hello from England. Yeah. Is it uh, the same true for silver? This was basically the question about metals. Yes. Yeah. As a matter of fact, uh, there are substances, for example, like silver nitrate which is found in a liquid, which is also sometimes put into, or was put into the eyes um, um, to prevent eye infections. Yeah, so actually silver, yes, is able to do something similar. And in case you're kind of wondering why metals are able to block um, the growth of, of microorganisms and of cells, this is actually also um, um, known in the, because many of the metals actually block enzymes. Yeah, they block certain enzymes or they bind against the enzymes and deactivate them and so basically the cell is not able to do any um, the, the enzyme is not able to do the, the chemical reactions anymore yeah? so many heavy metals that's actually how they're called like like silver cadmium and all of, all of these metals that you also find in batteries for example lead for example yeah, are harmful or poisonous because they block the functioning of enzymes inside the cell okay so, um, so that's uh, just, uh, yeah. Um, sometimes, here is now a comment or question, sometimes words like bacteria, parasite, and protist are a bit confusing because their meanings are pretty similar. Um, yeah, sometimes there are overlapping uh, terms and maybe uh, that's uh, actually a good point here. Um, yeah, there is a difference between a protist and bacteria. Okay, so that's maybe an interesting thing. Um, a protist is a eukaryote. That means uh, they, they are, these are cells that have a nucleus, um, as for example, I've uh, shown you here. This here is a protist. And uh, those uh, cells, which are protists, are single-celled eukaryotes. And eukaryotes, they have a nucleus in them. And those uh, eukaryotes, they also have so-called cell organelles. So they are larger and they have structures inside the cell. Bacteria are significantly smaller and they do not have those cell organelles, those structures in them. Yeah? All of the substances simply float around in there, but there is no what we biologists call compartmentalization. And so they're not separate areas that are closed off from the other areas yeah? in bacteria. Yeah? So there is in this case a, a, a difference here. Um, 
The next question is an interesting one here. Does the paramecium eat the algae for it to get inside? And if it doesn't digest it, how does it decide uh, what to eat and what to keep alive? That's an interesting one. Um, first of all, when this paramecium divides, what will happen is, is, is that the two cells will also um, receive uh, those algae. Yeah. Um, the question now is, is um, a little bit, uh, how did they get in in the first place? Well, it could have been indeed that they have eaten them, right? Um, and then they kind of established it uh, themselves. And usually um, what happens is, is that um, there are in um, on the algae on the cells there are sometimes or the very often those uh, proteins yeah and uh, it could be that those proteins are in such a way that the um, the cell does not recognize them as being harmful okay and therefore it, it kind of established itself inside the cell and this allowed it uh, to to reproduce yeah um, so um, so I'm, I'm just reading the comments again yeah um, yeah, hello from Colombia, okay. I think it's silver that you can put into the water container that, uh, of humidifiers um, for this purpose, I guess. Um, hmm. I don't know if that, uh, if, if, um, basically, um, I know that humidifiers, um, because there's water in there, of course, this can be a, a thing where bacteria kind of grow, and that's why you want to kind of prevent the bacteria maybe from growing. But honestly, if you put silver in there and the whole thing is kind of spread into the air and we inhale it, I don't know if this is, I don't know, yeah? Um, I don't want to have the silver in the air, yeah? But maybe it's a different water container, maybe it's a water container where you're con collecting the water and not the water which is actually then also released, yeah? yeah. Um, our fridge supposedly has silver inside to fight bacteria, but not sure how effective that is after some years of use. Yeah, um, um, I guess uh, the question is, yeah, um, uh, I guess the question is if uh, the silver, uh, the liquid, usually silver in, in soluble form is, is used up or not. Okay. So, but let me go back again to a couple of uh, the, because I still have a lot of qu yeah, um, questions here. Um, so this was basically the, the one with the, the cells. What is, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, this one actually is a, is, is a, yeah, goes with the worm. There is a, yeah, the question was a little bit is how am I making uh, those videos here, okay? Um, and uh, very briefly, um, so is he even the one looking through the microscope or is he just looking at a projected image on the screen and commenting on it? And that's actually the case. What I'm doing here is, is um, uh, also when I show you those, those videos, like I just showed you, yeah, um, in the software, I've actually prepared the video and I'm playing it and then I'm commenting over it. Or I can uh, actually uh, stream in directly a live image uh, from my microscopes. Yeah, I'm, I'm using a software called OBS Studio, which is a free uh, streaming software which allows me to do that. Yeah? So I can include uh, videos, I can include live uh, webcams, whatever, and I can kind of arrange it and put it together as I like. Yeah? So this is a little bit the, um, yeah, uh, uh, the uh, answers a little bit the question of, of how I'm making uh, these videos and, and um, in, in, in YouTube. Yeah, so that's simply a, a technical question about uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so let's uh, go a little bit uh, uh, microscopy related here. Um, it's more technical in nature. Can I buy a microscope with standard 160 objectives and then buy infinity objectives to swap them out if it's possible? Thanks for your help. Okay, I need to explain this here. Again, this is a, a question that appears fairly uh, frequently. Um, many um, microscope objectives um, have uh, the number 160 written on it. Okay, I don't, I don't know if this one has it. Okay, where is this? Uh, here, you might not be able to see it quite well, but there is the number 160 written on here. And this uh, refers to a tube length of 160 uh, millimeters and uh, generally um, microscopes that uh, are they have the 160 millimeter standard um, are basically interchangeable. So you can have, um, yeah, you can take them out and replace it with an under, under other 161. But modern microscopes like the one that I have um, um, over here next uh, to myself, these are so-called infinity um, optics and they're not compatible. Right? So even if you're able, if, even if they fit physically, even if you're able to put it in, they're not compatible because the optics are not compatible. Yeah? So my general advice is, is don't waste time trying to make infinity optics uh, fit on a non-infinity microscope or vice versa. Uh, even if you're somehow able to make them fit, um, yeah, it's, um, yeah, the, the optics are, are not compatible and you're not going to get a good picture. Okay, if you are able to get a picture at all. 
Yeah. So this is a little bit one of the, the, the limitations here concerning microscopes that um, yeah, the, the flexibility of exp and expandability is not always given. Uh, because uh, sometimes you're actually bound to the uh, to the brand even if you've got two different uh, infinity microscopes uh, from different companies even then the objectives are not compatible with each other yeah so this is a little bit uh, um, yeah uh, uh, something where that you have to be aware of when you for example want to upgrade your microscope that you don't uh, mix the objectives okay um, so, can you buy a different microscope head to correct that? I'm, I'm now a little bit confused to what this refers to, okay, or what I said. Okay, uh, I've tried making permanent slides using the PVA, uh, but get a lot of something, uh, a lot of bubbles maybe, okay. <laughs> this could be my suggestion is is that if you uh, maybe you want to dilute it a little bit with uh, uh, with water so um, what I've done is, is I use uh, yeah into the PVA glue I added a little bit of water and mixed it and then let it stand a little bit and, and sometimes this makes it more liquid and then um, bubbles don't appear so much okay um, yeah what, what else uh, yeah <laughs> it says do you think it has feelings okay um, and um, there are um, this is the focus one that I would like to demonstrate on my microscope okay yeah but in digital industrial microscopes and those two here so I would like to show you now actually one of the most watched videos it's a YouTube short uh, of my channel I think it's got over 10 million views already uh, let me see where I can find it. Uh, yeah, many of you might have already seen it, and these questions refer to that. Yeah, uh, this is um, a now there is no sound here. Okay, but if you go into the shorts section, um, this is uh, a YouTube short that I made um, of a worm being squashed <laughs> by two air bubbles. And I would like to give you a little bit background information here of how I actually uh, made this. Yeah. Um, the, the worm is uh, Iolosoma. It's a fairly large worm. I showed it to you already many times uh, before. And yeah, I just wanted to have a fun, interesting video. Um, and essentially what I've done is, is I placed uh, this worm um, on a microscope slide, of course, and I allowed uh, the water to evaporate. And I simply want to show you now how I've done this because I have not explained this yet. In this case, I need to quickly uh, pause the video again. Pause the video, let's go yeah, back here a little bit. And uh, I again also need an arrow. Where's my arrow? Okay, no, that's the wrong one. See, I'm still struggling a little bit with the ah, here is the arrow in the back, so I can move it around again. Okay, so of course, here's the worm. Um, and what you uh, see is you see an air bubble approaching from the bottom and the top. And why is this air bubble approaching? Well, because simply the water is evaporating. But the question is now, where is this worm? Can it be found? Well, what you see here um, on the right side and on the left side are actually two cover glasses. And I put, of course, a cover glass on top. And this way I made a little um, channel, so to say. Yeah? And uh, the worm uh, basically uh, could not penetrate uh, the surface tension of the two air bubbles. Uh, this is, uh, <laughs> some people who watched this video actually complained uh, in the comment section saying, this is a completely pointless video. Yeah, why are you even doing that? And I totally agree. Um, it's a completely pointless video. Um, but still, it's one of the most viewed videos in this channel here. <laughs> um, but uh, in any case, uh, the question was always is uh, where did the worm then escape to? Okay, so here basically you can see the worm. Yeah, it's quite flexible. Yeah, the worm was not harmed. Yeah, dark field. I switched over to dark field. Yeah, so the, I filled it up with water again. Time lapse. And where's the worm going? And some people say, well, it somehow penetrated the wall. It somehow went through the wall. No, there, there is no wall there. It's simply going beneath the cover glass. Yeah? It's kind of lifting up the cover glass here. And, and that's how it was able to kind of escape. And uh, yeah, I, sp I made it a little bit faster. And uh, then uh, I, I said, yeah, the worm tries to avoid this uncomfortable place. And uh, then, um, of course, uh, um, I got a lot of comments because the worm kind of seemed to behave intelligently. And there were qu comments uh, like, uh, or questions like, like these, do you think it has feelings? I is it afraid? Okay, um, so the air bubble thing is because of the surface tension of the water, but th does the worm have feelings? And I have to tell you, um, I would always be a little bit um, careful of um, 
projecting human characteristics on animals. Um, so these animals are very simple, they do not have uh, a complex brain, uh, they have so-called ganglia, which are um, connections of, uh, collections of nerve uh, cells. Of course they respond to the environment, all living things do that, um, but actually um, do they have feelings? Um, supposedly not or not the way that we know it, because uh, they do not have a brain. Now, I know some people are going to say, well, can you be sure? I have to say, of course, I cannot be sure. Um, be, but, uh, but ultimately, I have to tell you, and this is where it's getting really philosophical now, and I don't want to get lost in that corner, <laughs> in that rabbit hole, but philosophically, I cannot even be sure whether other people have feelings, because I can only talk about myself. Yeah? Maybe, all, all, maybe everything is an illusion and maybe everything is just uh, everyone else is a robot, so to say, without feelings, and I'm the only person who exists in the universe. Yeah? This is actually a philosophical, um, how do you say, way of viewing the world, um, because I cannot put myself into the position of another animal, right? Um, so um, this is something that is also not scientifically testable in any way, right? Um, so. Um, but I think the, the real important thing is, is the following, is in, that has to do something with ethics. Um, um, ethics about treating animals and, and bacteria and microorganisms, and that's a topic that kind of keeps on reappearing many times, is this, um, while I do not think that they have feelings the way that we humans have them, obviously, I still think that uh, um, we should try to treat them reasonably with respect, not for their sake, but for my own sake. Okay, because I, as a as a human being, um, yeah, want to be, um, yeah, how do you say, uh, respectful to 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 the environment. However, at the same time, I think it is not ethically acceptable or good uh, to kind of uh, see them um, on the same level as humans, right? I mean, I've uh, received lots of comments in the YouTube sections where I see seen some paramecia or some single-celled microbes being squashed by the cover glass. And people got upset about that and said it's, uh, I don't know, yeah, the torturing of animals. And I say, no, I do not um, put them on the same level uh, um, because uh, I actually uh, think uh, that uh, one should not do that. Uh. But at the same time, one has to treat them, of course, reasonably with respect. Enough philosophy, okay? Enough philosophy right now. And I'm going to go through the next couple of questions. For photography, you can actually combine finite microscope lenses uh, with uh, tube lenses. So using them on fin infinity microscopes should work most of the time, but not the other way around. Now that's an interesting one. You can actually combine finite microscope lenses with tube lenses, but I suppose they might. I, I suppose this is possible, but you have to probably change the distance between the objective um, and uh, um, uh, and the specimen. I did actually read in a forum once that um, you can probably somehow create an image probably with any uh, quite flexible combinations but maybe the image quality is not always the best yeah because the objectives are designed to work with a certain um, distance uh, to the to the microscope slide in any case um, it might be possible but I think it's uh, quite uh, uh, quite experimental yeah I bought a dark field slider for my size uh, premium star one and after using it I have black dot in the, on the center do you think using oil on Abbe condenser will fix it um, if you have a black dot on the center uh, then try changing the height um, of the um, uh, uh, of the um, uh, of the condenser and if you have a slider and if there are different uh, dark field uh, uh, patch stops in there then this could be because uh, ideally you have a different dark field patch stop for the different um, objectives. Um, so maybe um, this could be a, a, a reason um, that you're they're not matched, but most likely it could maybe also be that the height of the condenser is not right. Okay, so this is uh, simply some some recommendations. Um, only put oil on the only put oil on the condenser if it's uh, designed to do that. Not all condensers are oil uh, oil tight. Yeah? So that's uh, why I do not generally want to give uh, these recommendations. Okay, so let me quickly see here. Okay, uh, hi from Denmark. Yesterday I found my first gastro trick. It was an amazing feeling. Yeah. Okay. Do you have a favorite animal? So, yeah. Um. Yeah. I mean, there are a couple of uh, of, 
microorganisms or microanimals that are more interesting to observe than others. I, I wouldn't say I have a favorite one. There are a couple of ones I mean, that uh, I always keep on going back to and making videos because they're just fun to observe. Water bears, for example. Yeah. Um, I like uh, yeah, generally quite, uh, quite uh, all of them um, and usually uh, what I'm more interested in is, is then uh, to get some kind of nice images or videos of, of those. Yeah. So um, I'm quickly going down here again. Um, have uh, there been any updates or advancements that are either on the horizon or that just came out that you are excited about related to microscopy? Um, yeah, well, actually they are, but I would say that these are quite um, advanced, uh, advanced topics. You know what, if, while I'm just uh, talking like this, why not uh, switch over to the microscope view simply so that we can see a little bit of stuff here. Well, actually the sample is starting to dry up already anyway. Um, yeah, there are of course all, um, um, there are advancements even in the field of light microscopy. Okay, yes, it's a water sample with a whole bunch of, of small protozoans and also, um, and also uh, diatoms. There's a reason why I show you the fine focus, not because one of the questions refers to this. Um, but the question is, is, are there any advancements? Well, for example, cryogenic microscopy. I just recently read about that. I think there's been a Nobel Prize a few years ago, even in uh, 2017 or so. And this uh, type, uh, but that's electron, micro electron microscopy, right? And this allows you actually to see an individual molecule. So what they do is, is they put a sample with uh, a pure substance, a certain protein, um, and they quickly freeze it. They freeze it so quickly that uh, the water does not form crystals. Normally ice crisp water when you freeze it forms ice crystals. But what you do in this case is, is you freeze it so quickly that the water is not able to form ice crystals and it remains amorphous. So uh, basically the, the proteins in this liquid are suspended in this amorphous ice. Yeah? frozen water and then you can actually uh, using in, an electron beam you can actually observe those um, those uh, molecules and because they are or oriented in different directions and um, you can take many pictures of them and the computer will put together the molecule again and then you have a 3d model of the molecule it's called cryogenic um, electron microscopy i think it's a very exciting thing but this is research stuff you know and and um, highly advanced stuff, uh, but um, it's not really, yeah, not nature observation as, as, as we're doing here right now. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just started with microscopy and collecting water from my yard pond. Okay. Yeah. So they're just general comments here. Okay. Um, let's let's move on a little bit um, again. Okay. Um, yeah, so basically, which water has protozoans in it and are they, aren't they dangerous? Well, it depends on the protozoans and it depends on the density, right? Um, so, uh, of course, there are certain protozoans in there, many of them actually, yeah, who, which can cause diseases or so, but it does not always mean that you can get them over water. It, some of them you, you can get over food, for example. Um, so you cannot really generalize this. Yeah? And uh, generally, I would, um, of course, avoid to go into contaminated water. Um, on the other hand, uh, some people um, are a little bit nervous over because of, of, of certain news reports uh, about the so-called, in the media, so-called the brain-eating amoeba. Uh, people were worried about that. I received comments uh, from that. Um, um, also, if you go in Reddit and on, on online forums, it's a very rare possibility of, of, of actually catching this uh, passage. And there are many more. Uh, yeah, um, You want to hear a, 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 a common protozoan, which is dangerous malaria. For example, the protozoan that, uh, that the, uh, yeah, which causes malaria is, is uh, yeah, malaria is a dangerous disease. Huh? So that is essentially the thing, but it's not in water, it's transmitted over mosquitoes. So you see that certain diseases are, are highly specific to the mode of transmission here. Huh? So you cannot generalize this, but uh, at the same time, yes, of course, uh, there are, can be protozoans around that are dangerous, but it depends also on the mode of transmission and of the, the concentration. Huh? So this is, um, yeah, as you can see, um, some of the questions are not really yes, no answers, but it, very often it, it, it depends because nature is so diverse yeah, and, and, and uh, it depends really a lot. Yeah. Hi, Oliver, you should do a video on the different uh, image uh, planes on the microscope and show the 
rear plane under different samples of really pretty the different image planes okay this is getting very technical so basically the image plane were for example the objective here yeah when you when you observe something then 160 millimeters from here it actually projects an image right and that's uh, basically one image plane um, and then the eyepiece picks up um, on that yeah? so that would be an interesting one but it's a little bit technical in nature yeah yep so okay um, let, let's move on a little bit um, I also have to look a little bit at the time so it's uh, 35 minutes yeah why not um, talk a little bit I think uh, this was uh, yeah I think uh, this, uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about this one I don't know exactly if this is the question that I'm going to answer now properly but I think it's quite quite interesting hello Oliver does the precision with which the focus can be controlled matter so basically the fine focus if so, is there a way to compare this precision control between two microscopes? Do the manufacturers specify this in their specs? Thanks. Okay, I think I'm going to um, switch over to the microscope view. And um, I think uh, the question is now you have to look at the, um, at the where is this? Yeah, all the way in the corner. Okay, um, here, th this is the fine focus knob. You can see that it, when I turn it, it goes in and out of focus, right? And uh, there are little lines on here. Okay, um, and uh, I think uh, if I'm correctly informed, one of those lines is I think a, micro, uh, a, micro, a, mi a micrometer. That's how it's uh, defined with my microscope. But I'm going to now give you a show you a little uh, way how you can determine this yourself. Okay, so um, and it's not even that difficult. Um, how can you determine basically how far the stage moves up and down if you rotate it once? Okay, that's a little bit uh, the question. You can figure this out quite easily. And what you need to do is, I'm, I'm taking now the slide away. I need a, a, a blank slide, nothing on it. And you take a cover glass. And now I'm going to actually show you what I've done here. Desk view again. Okay, there is, this is a cover glass and I've um, made a cross on here. But the important thing is, is, is the, um, I made a cross uh, on one line on the top, then I turned it around and made the other line the other way, yeah, on the bottom side. Okay, so there's a line on the top and there's a one, one line on the other side. Okay, those uh, microscope cover glasses have a thickness, if you use the standard size, of approximately 0 0.15 millimeters. Uh, I, I know that the objective says 0 0.17 in most cases. Okay. Yeah, but many of those uh, yeah, cover glasses have 0 0.15. Um, not all of them exactly the same because there is a, a manufacturing tolerance as well. Okay, But for our purposes, simply to demonstrate this is going to be good enough. And what you do is, is you don't need any water or anything. You just put it on here. And then what you want to do is, is you want to observe. You want to observe the place where the, the two lines cross each other. Okay, And then we're going to rotate the fine focus knob and we're going to measure out how far we have to rotate it until we've passed the 0 0.15 millimeters okay so i'm going to put it in here okay i, I need to, i need to go back into the microscope view because actually it's it worked surprisingly well okay so i'm going to move away this here go a little bit darker now i have to find the place Okay, here, we, you know what, I'm going to go a little bit lower with the magnification, it doesn't matter. So this is basically, and I have to find this X somehow. Where is it? Yeah, here, here maybe. Right. Or let me see. Yeah, it was a little bit um, over, overexposed. Yeah, here, here, okay. So here is where the two, a place where the two lines cross. And uh, what I'm now going to do is I'm going to focus on one of those lines okay and now you see that the one diagonal line is in focus again i'm going to kind of try to find this with the arrow okay so you see that this uh, is now basically this line here is in focus you see all of those ink uh, yeah it's basically a permanent marker that i used yeah right and this line on the other side of the cover glass is out of focus and then what you do is, is you kind of remember the setting here and i've got a hundred lines going around it okay and a um, hundred lines going around it and now I'm going to rotate it until the bottom line or the top one depending on how you see it um, is, is now in focus okay so now I've uh, basically that's now the start setting uh, and now I'm going to uh, uh, rotate this I hope I'm rotating this into the correct direction right yeah and now the other one is in focus 
okay this line is in focus okay and uh, what I have done yeah so basically look uh, this is now one rotation and half a rotation and now the other line up and now the other line is now here in focus so I need one and a half rotations one rotation and half a rotation and now this line again is it is in focus okay so basically um, what this means is is that uh, hun one and a half rotations means and if one rotation has a hundred little lines here 150 lines okay um, for essentially 0 0.15 millimeters and all I have to do is I have to divide the 0 0.15 millimeters by 150 okay and then I have uh, the in millimeters I have then uh, the distance here okay so that is actually a way of how you can determine yourself how far this is is moving up and down when you when you rotate rotate this okay yeah. so this is um, actually a way of, of um, yeah and uh, yeah I think it, it works uh, quite well this way yeah. so simply to yeah, yeah actually in most cases you probably don't even need to know that <laughs> you just observe and you don't do any measurements but in case you're interested that's a way of, of actually figuring this out okay so um, yeah any suggestions on types of solutions that will create interesting crystals uh, right on slides um yeah there is actually already a comment here caffeine vitamin c go for vitamin c if you don't know where to start um you can start off with salt as well however salt does not uh, give very nice patterns in polarized light or well, colors rather not because it's not polarizing but still yeah take a little bit of, of, of uh, salt water and and, uh, and dissolve it in, in uh, you know, put it on the slide and allow it to evaporate and you're going to see some nice crystals okay so let's move on okay uh, let's move on um, yeah what will happen this is uh, what about yeah let, let's talk about some other technical stuff uh, Barlow lens is important what's a Barlow lens so I actually brought some along here okay just I would like to, to illustrate this and, and demonstrate this uh, what a Barlow lens is um, yeah <laughs> look look at this what I got here uh, actually it's in my other channel a long time ago several years ago I made a video here I bought myself can you believe it two Barlow lenses I cannot even read this here <laughs> yeah I got I they were ridiculously cheap I got them from from China uh, from I think Aliexpress or banggood.com um, I don't know um, but those uh, yeah actually when I was very surprised when they came because they're made fully of metal and they look very nicely made of high quality and believe it or not yes they do work uh, I think I paid about what three euros three to four dollars for one of these things here uh, and uh, what are they good for well what they do is is uh, you can put it in, in yeah into a microscope and then your eyepiece goes in here so i've got a 25 times eyepiece right and then you multiply it by two now i've got a and you put it in i've got a 50 times eyepiece wow <laughs> and look at this what happens if i add this one here as well yeah 25 times 2 times 2 100 times eyepiece wow if i keep on doing that i can blow up the magnification like crazy <laughs> um no uh, yeah it, it's it's actually kind of pointless uh, because the image will become blurrier of course you're going to magnify it more but it's also going to become much blurrier so you're not really going to see a lot more so why did i buy them because i wanted to try it out right and <laughs> yeah, so um, it does they do work uh, they do make it larger of course but uh, um, everything becomes so shaky yeah, because uh, yeah, uh, almost the smallest movement will kind of disturb everything already again but that is a, the function of a Barlow lens and what it does essentially is, is if you look uh, through it here um, it actually yeah if, I don't know if you're able to see it actually makes things appear smaller okay yeah maybe you can see the text here um, it makes it appear smaller so you might be a little bit surprised well if it makes it smaller why does it actually increase the magnification and the reason is is because um, it makes the uh, 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 by making it smaller here by kind of bending a, a, apart the light path um, of the objective the image of the objective becomes larger okay so the intermediate image of the objective which is created is kind of spread apart maybe you can imagine this a little bit and then this kind of uh, causes the uh, the image to become larger and then you're essentially magnifying 
um, um, a large Im image. So this actually has an effect not so much on the on the eyepiece, uh, but actually on the image which is created uh, by the objective. Yeah. Um, so, but that is a bar law, and uh, yeah, not necessary. Okay. Um, if you want to try it out, why not? It's nice to play around with it. Uh, you can gain some experience, um, and then you can probably discover it that yeah, you, you won't. It won't uh, be um, then not abs not absolutely necessary. But there are um, also other Barlow lenses that I would like to to show you. Okay, and uh, these are those here for a stereo microscope. And those Barlow lenses actually are already a little bit, or can be already a little bit more useful. And you see here a Barlow lens, it magnifies two times. Okay, that's kind of clear. But look at this here, it says it's 0 0.5 times. You have a Barlow lens that reduces the magnification. Why would you do that? And those are basically, those are Barlow lenses um, are mounted on the bottom of uh, the stereo microscope. So I don't know, I'm gonna switch over to the stereo microscope view. Okay, and um, I know I'm, I'm just gonna put some, some text in here so that is the text maybe go down a little bit with yeah and uh, uh, unfortunately I'd have to refocus and I'm gonna put the 0 0.5 beneath it okay um, and you're gonna see well, yeah it is a little bit smaller uh, but 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 what's the point really right uh, the advantage of this is, is that um, I can I'm just holding it in there I didn't screw it on okay that you can actually move up and I'm not moving it up I'm able to move up the the microscope much more, okay? The yeah, the microscope head, and this increases the distance between the objective and the specimen. So that the, the actual point of this this Barlow, the 0.5 Barlow lens for a stereo microscope, is is actually not not, not so much that I really want to change the magnification or have a lower magnification. You can always do that maybe also by, by zooming out, right? Um, but actually, this is to increase the distance between the object and uh, and the objective. Yeah. So sometimes this is is uh, quite nice to have, especially if you're doing, for example, um, working with electronics under the stereo microscope. You need a lot of space, um, and then you want to have a large distance, and that's the reason why you have those. Um, yeah, 0 0.5 bar lows. Yeah. Um, so and uh, now what about the let's say the two times bar low? Okay, this one over here, well, that's kind of obvious. The two times Barlow, of course, really does increase the magnification here, but it's so blurry now, I have to actually go further down. Okay. Oh, I dropped it, okay? But you get the idea, yeah? I didn't screw it in now for the sake of time, yeah? And now it's, it's much larger, okay? And I'm just holding it now because I was too lazy to kind of, yeah? Maybe I'm gonna go up with the light as well a little bit here. And then I can even zoom in even more. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. Um, the distance between the object, uh, the, the Barlow lens and the objective and, and the specimen is now just I don't know this much. It's really close. Um, and there's of course also a problem because you're kind of blocking the light as well. So you need a proper light, a you know, ring light maybe or something like that. Yeah. So I'm just gonna go back again here. Yeah. So, but that, is, that was essentially a short, uh, yeah, um, illustration of, of why I think that those Barlow lenses for stereo microscopes can be useful occasionally, right? But for the compound microscope, simply to increase the magnification, I don't know. Yeah, it's just becoming more, more and more blurry. Okay, so um, let's go back here again here to the comments. Yeah, I'm just going to skip ahead only when there is actually really when it's addressed to me. Could you, would you put a US currency money and vodka gin under your microscope, honestly? Um, I don't have US currency with me now. As a matter of fact, I, don't, I left my wallet in the other room, but that's something that I can do, you know what? A good suggestion, thank you for the suggestion. I can actually do again a, a stereo microscopy session, maybe in the upcoming weeks, where I'm putting some stuff again um, under the stereo microscope. And vodka gin under your microscope, um, I could do that, but I'm gonna, you're gonna be very disappointed. You're not going to see a lot because um, it's pure, okay? Not pure, but how do you call this? Um, 
there are no suspended particles in it. So basically, it's it's, it's a solvent, yeah, and a solution rather, and and uh, therefore I'm not able to see anything. So one of the things that you, I might be able to do is is um, take uh, those drinks and allow the the alcohol and the water to evaporate and hope that maybe there are going to be some crystals forming. But the, as a, in a liquid form, vodka and gin or other beverages, um, if, if they're transparent, yeah, you're not going to see anything. Orange juice is a different thing, okay? There are suspended particles in there, and therefore you're not able to go look through orange juice. Yeah, um, and uh, then there might be actually something to be able to see. Um, uh, yeah, uh, but uh, clear liquids, um, you will not see anything unless you allow it to dry and unless crystals form. Okay, so uh, money's been so modified to avoid counterfeits. I think uh, what it looks like a close up is interesting, and some vodka most gins have herbs in them, but I think it's um, even um, intersecting. Yeah, of course, uh, vodka and gins and, and drinks, they have those herbal substances in them, but these are all in solution. This means there are no particles in there that you could, could actually see under the microscope. Yeah? So that's a little bit the, 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 the thing. So it's kind of an extract of the chemicals of a plant that are in there, um, but not uh, no particles, and then you're not able to see it with a microscope. Yeah? Um, uh, yeah, uh, how do they come out clear translucent to I'd like to know if it's possible to see any of these additives gin and vodka? Well, uh, uh, what, what, what you do when you make those alcoholic beverages, what you do is, is you take whatever you want to ferment, okay, in the case of wine for example, your grapes or yeah, whatever, um, and you allow it to ferment and, and then you have a, a suspension with yeast cells in it, plant material, but that's what, what, what they're doing is and then there, um, it, there's a distillation process happening. In this distillation process, you, you heat it up and then you, you basically separate, the, you remove the harmful alcohol, usually the methanol, which is poisonous, you remove that. Um, and then, um, yeah, because it evaporates and then it condenses and then you kind of collect the clear liquid again, yeah, so that you do not have any, any particles in there. So that's the distillation process. Yeah? Um, and therefore, yeah, you are not able to see anything under the microscope. Yeah. Um, yeah. Are working distance affecting resolution in this case using the stereoscope? Uh, you actually get a better resolution with that lens. Um, difficult to say. Um, let's put it this way. Um, I think two things that I would like to say. Every optical element that you put into the light path generally will decrease the image quality somehow. The reason is, is um, that there are, um, at the place where the glass and the air is, is there are um, kind of, uh, um, in, uh, how do you say this, um, the diff diffraction happening the, uh, and uh, there are reflections happening. So some of the light actually doesn't go through but bounces back into the glass. So any optical elements that you add into the light path will also reduce image contrast. Yeah? So this is the reason why um, some companies spend quite a bit of, of, of time and effort to, and kind of coating the optics to minimize those reflections. And indeed, uh, sometimes they are so small that it does not really, you won't even notice it. Yeah? So that's the first thing that I want to say. And the second thing that I want to say is that those stereo microscopes that we have here, generally they work below the resolution limit. Um, so compound microscopes, we are already approaching the resolution limit. Um, of what light is able to resolve. So basically we're already approaching the limit of light, but not yet with stereo, uh, stereo microscopes. Yeah? So I would say if there is indeed a, a difference, then, then, uh, then probably it, you won't be able to see it very much. Um, I would guess, okay, here. Yeah? Um, so, but um, yeah. Um, I, I will tell you actually what does impact image quality quite a bit. And uh, about the stereo microscope, let's, let's uh, stick uh, to that again. So let's focus this a little bit. Um, if you look at this, um, this uh, writing here on paper, and right now it is blurry, it's now in focus, okay? And um, yeah, it's still a bit blurry, okay? It's not perfectly clear, especially when we zoom in a little bit more. Yeah, it's not properly, yeah, power focal. And you actually, let's yeah, look at this here. It's, it's, 
it's fine but it's it's a little bit blurry and if you actually look through the uh, the microscope itself it's much more crisp so what's going on here and this is actually something that i've uh, seen with several stereo microscopes uh, especially is, is that the, the image quality that you get o o over over camera yeah, is, is not quite as as, as high um, as when you're looking directly into uh, the microscope. Why is that? Well, and I'm going to now take off the, the camera to be able to show it to you. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the desk view here. Okay, so I hope the cable is long enough. Yeah. So that, that's the camera that I have here. So it's a five megapixel camera. But here, what we have here, this is called the reduction optics. Yeah, and what I found out is, is that the reduction optics that, uh, that this camera has will actually enlarge the image so that um, it's not in a circle, okay? So it's kind of zooming in more so that you get a full yeah, rectangular image you're filling the sensor. So it's adding a, an additional magnification here and this additionally blurs the image a little bit more, number one, simply because we're magnifying in more. But at the se uh, same time, these are again several lens elements that actually cause a degradation, a lowering of image quality. And another thing that I want to say is, is that um, and it's uh, not only with microscopes, but also with telescopes, for example, that every everywhere where there is a corner, so to say, right, uh, where the, 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 the lens touches a corner, the side, this is also where diffraction happens. So the light rays that basically are there, they will be bent, yeah, and this actually also causes a degradation in image quality. Yeah? So you see that there are actually several factors here that kind of lower it and make it a little bit blurrier. And sometimes, ironically, what I found out is, is that sometimes by connecting a mobile phone camera to the microscope, sometimes I even got a better image quality. Now, why is that? Yeah, a mobile phone camera? And the reason is, I think, um, it is because the mobile phone camera, you're actually able to see the whole image um, inside a circle and it actually makes the image doesn't magnify it but it actually makes it smaller so you do not see all of these imperfections as, as, as much so you see there are so many factors that play a role here that it's kind of difficult to 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 say yeah so uh, this was a little bit of an excursion into technology here but again a question here when we drink alcohol does it kill white blood cells and can we observe what happens under the microscope while we're intoxicated um okay the thing is the following alcohol um, uh, uh, if the level of alcohol concentration is so high that it is we're able to kill white blood cells it would not only kill white blood cells but also other cells and that would be way too high okay then you're ready you've got a problem what happens is the following in the case of alcohol and actually there are some questions about the, you know this here as well um, is is that uh, the alcohol is absorbed into the blood in by the intestine but is not passed on directly to the rest of the body yet because the blood with the alcohol first has to go through the liver and the liver has an enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase which breaks down the alcohol before the the blood is able to go to the rest of the body so basically the liver detoxifies and removes some of the alcohol um, and the rest so basically what goes into the blood is the rest alcohol yeah um, so this is uh, uh, really uh, yeah Im important here um, so um, are you able to see what happens under the microscope when you're intoxicated probably not so much because the uh, there is an effect on the nervous system and what the alcohol does is it, it uh, also harms the so-called the myelin um, of the nerve cells there the nerve cells they have uh, like um, an insulation around it called the myelin um, and the alcohol breaks that down and this causes a, a problem in nerve signal passing. So for this reason, um, I mean, I, I, I guess what one could do is one could probably extract some nerve cells with and without alcohol and, and maybe be able to see if there's some, some effect maybe, right? Um, but uh, I would say that it, there is a, a strong physio physiological effect even if this da damage is small okay and because uh, otherwise the whole nerve cell is going to die off yeah if uh, if the alcohol concentration is too high and as a matter of fact this does, does happen i mean this is the reason why people who are um, continually intoxicated um, the brain cells start to die off because you're killing off the alcohol kills off the nerve cells yeah because the alcohol actually does the following yeah here we have something 
because this is why it's a little bit related. Yeah, well, yeah, basically the question is, is which microorganisms does detergent kill? A detergent like, for example, soap um, will uh, kill microorganisms because the soap dissolves the cell membrane um, of the bacteria or the microbe. The cell membrane is a lipid, is made of lipid, of fat, and uh, soap as well, and uh, the soap will therefore remove uh, or damage this uh, membrane. And this is what detergents do, right? And alcohol does something different. The alcohol is able to dissolve the, the fatty uh, layer of the myelin of, of the nerve cells. And for this reason, the cells can be become damaged, okay? So uh, this is uh, basically related to this one here. Um, because there was a question a little bit about using soap and detergent because ac uh, actually, yeah, I, I don't now remember where I got this here. Um, I made a video several years ago where I put this, uh, this Corona test liquid, you know, this, uh, for this uh, quick test for the Corona test a couple of years ago, you had to kind of take a uh, cotton swab and, and take some sample from the nose and then you put it into the liquid and, and then you had to put the liquid on the, on the ta test thing and, and yeah, and this liquid actually contains a very strong detergent because the virus, the coronavirus with a membrane, um, the membrane had to be removed, right? And this detergent actually removed this membrane at the same time, uh, not damaging the proteins that you want to analyze. Yeah? And uh, I added now this detergent to some water samples and you could actually see the cells pop open quite dramatically. Yeah? Um, so any suggestions on where to find uh, information for identifying protists, algaes and other aquatic life? Um, oh gosh, uh, again, the book is somewhere on my shelf. Yes, there are uh, reference books available. However, what I would say is um, it can become specific very quickly, okay? Um, it can become advanced very quickly and uh, very often you, in a water sample, you're able to find um, microorganisms, algae and so on, um, that might be difficult to identify because they don't quite match that what you have in the book because um, yeah, maybe it's something new or it looks a little bit different um, because there's simply so many things out there. So uh, sometimes uh, when you identify microorganisms or other water organisms, then sometimes you can actually simply get it into category. Oh, that's a rotifer, for example, but there are probably thousands of different types of species. Oh, that is an, that's a single celled algae. Oh, that's a diatom, right? Um, but if you actually wanna go deeper, which species is it? then it can become more and more difficult depending on, on, on the level that you actually want to, uh, to look at. Yeah? And sometimes even under the microscope, it is not even possible to distinguish them because, uh, um, because they look the same. Just because two organisms look the same uh, does not mean that they're necessarily always closely related. Yeah? Yeah. So this is another yeah, water sample. I don't know, maybe it's a little bit too bright here. And uh, it's always uh, the thing that I have to find the things. Yeah, that's this. Yeah, for example, it's, let, let's 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 have a, have a look at this one here, right? Yeah, this looks a little bit. Yeah, it's a water crustacean. Okay. So uh, like like <laughs> like an ostracod? No, yeah, not not an ostracod. Yeah, um, yeah, it's a water crustacean. But I mean, I don't know. There are so many of those. Yeah. Um, if you actually want to identify it all the way down to, this, to the species, you're probably not able to do that. Yeah? Um, but yeah, so it depends a little bit on identification. How, how general do you want it to be? I mean, usually I always use this example. Um, I mean, it's, when you go out on the street in the city, okay, oh, it's a car, right? You can see it from a very far distance. But if you actually want to know the model of the car or the brand of the car, the make of the car, then you have to dig in deeper a little bit and you have to look at the specific details that distinguish the cars, right? Um, and uh, especially for identification, I mean, if you uh, just to give you an example here, um, if you want to distinguish the different brands or models of cars, looking at the number of tires that it has is not a good thing because they all have the same, right? Um, so you have to look for those uh, characteristics that actually allow you to distinguish the cars from each other. And every car has its kind of unique characteristics or combination of characteristics. So for example, the, the classic example would be, uh, what characteristic would you look for to identify whether a car is a Mercedes, for example? 
Well, then you look for the Mercedes star. So it's one characteristic which is sufficient for identifying the car. But then now you say, well, but actually Mercedes, there's so many different cars that the company makes, right? Well, then you have to look again deeper. And it's a little bit like this um, also under the microscope. It's easy. Oh, it's an algae, right? Of course. Yeah. But which one? Well, it's a filamentous algae. Okay. Because it's in strings, right? Um, so which one? Well, does it have a spiral shaped chloroplaston? Oh, that's a spirogyra. Okay. Um, but they're again, similar ones. So you see, um, you kind of try to um, step by step approach the whole thing and uh, yeah, and try to narrow it down what you have. Yeah. Um, but because of the large number um, of, of specimens, of course, this might be sometimes difficult. Yeah. So this was the questions about uh, um, identification of, of protists, algae, and other aquatic life. Yeah? Usually what I do is, is, is um, if, if I find something um, in, in, in an identification book, I usually type it into Google, the, 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 the scientific name, and then I see pictures, not only drawings, but pictures. And then you, it's uh, sometimes uh, more easily, you can compare it more easily. Yeah? So blood alcohol concentration is whatever the liver has broken down into another form of alcohol. Well, let's put it this way. Um, no, um, I would say the blood alcohol concentration is that what the liver was not able to break down. And so you have a certain the intestine, the small intestine absorbs the alcohol. Um, alcohol is a poison, is a toxin. Yeah. And the purpose of the liver is this uh, before the blood is released to the rest of the body. Um, the liver has to detoxify. So the liver contains a lot of enzymes that breaks down the alcohol. Um, and because no, it can, could not break down all of the alcohol, um, it, uh, some of the alcohol is then able to go to the rest of the body. And that's probably the thing, well, that's the thing that then can be found in the, in, in the blood, right? And of course, the, liver, the blood is also pumped again through the liver and is broken down again. And that's why um, over a couple of hours, the blood alcohol level drops down again. Yeah? So that's uh, simply the thing, but uh, actually there is uh, the blood from the intestine actually is first passed through the liver to remove um, possible harmful substances. Yeah? Um, how do we know if we've discovered a new species of rotifer or another microbe? <laughs> that's, a, that's a good one. Uh, I say because that is really something that I was a little bit involved in when I was studying at the university and I was not uh, so much in the discovery of, of uh, micro animals like rotifers or so on, but I was involved in, uh, by, in identifying bacteria. And uh, let's put it this way, there's a classical way of doing it and there is probably a more modern way of doing it. The classical way of uh, identifying it, mm, there are two several classical ways. Of course, you can look at certain specific characteristics. Um, and maybe a certain organism has certain characteristics that it did not have, that others don't have, okay? So maybe over here in this water crustacean over here, yeah, maybe there is a, a certain combination of characteristics that you have not seen before. And then you say, ah, oh, maybe it's a, it's a new species, okay? So that's one thing. But again, as I told you already before in, with microscopes, um, it, that can be sometimes a little bit difficult because maybe um, highly related organisms um, are very different from each other, are different species or, or um, yeah, so you cannot always say that. So uh, another way of, of doing that, and you're doing that actually with bacteria, is, is to do a biochemical analysis. You're growing the bacteria in pure culture and then you're analyzing the chemical composition. At the same time, problem. Uh, depending on what growth medium they have, the, their chemical composition might change or the age of the culture might determine the chemical composition and so on. So that's what, I, that's what actually what I did during my master's thesis. I've grown bacteria and extracted a variety of different compounds, what they're made of, and did I, um, um, using analytical chemistry, I kind of determined what a bacterium was made of. And then I've checked through all sorts of publications and, and, and scientific papers and I tried to kind of pull everything together, kind of to narrow it down what it could be. And then of course you discover, oh my gosh, I don't, they didn't find this combination yet yeah, of, of characteristics. So could it be something new, right? Um, so, um, yeah, but that, that's a very work intensive uh, process. And these days, nowadays, what you do is, is the, 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 the fast ways is you make directly DNA analysis. So you, you take uh, the, the organism in question, you, you take a part of the DNA, 
usually the, with bacteria it's the 16S RDNA section of the ribosomal uh, uh, DNA. In, in eukaryotes it, it would be for example the 18S ribosomal DNA. Um, it's a certain section that you use PCR to copy this uh, piece of the DNA and then you hand it over to the, the guy in the neighboring lab who is doing the sequencing for you. They have a machine and it determines the base sequence of the DNA and then he sends you an email and then you copy paste the email of the base sequence into the database. I'm getting very technical now. And then the computer pops out you know, how similar your DNA of, of this organism is, is with whatever is in the database. I think I got very carried away now and <laughs> very technically detailed. In other words, these days you do a DNA um, test and then you kind of hope I hope that I am not able to find my sequence in the database because if it's in the database, then somebody else already discovered it. Yeah, so you kind of hope that you cannot find it in there, right? So this is a little bit um, uh, going into the the details on how you can actually uh, discover new species. Yeah? And then what you do is you write a scientific paper, and then you can give it a name. Yeah, and you propose a name, but you're not allowed to name the bacterium or whatever according to yourself. That's uh, they won't allow that. Yeah, you can name it in honor of somebody else, but not according to yourself. Yeah. So, is there a panel of scientists that reviews? Yeah, of course. Uh, scientific papers are always reviewed. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah. so that is uh, um, always the case. Yeah. Um, so, um, so you don't. Uh, I'm, I'm reading. I'm reading. I'm reading. Yeah. Um, is one of your videos you had a, an identification book where do you recommend to get one from yes the identification book that I uh, keep on recommending is in German but it doesn't matter it doesn't matter because it's mostly the drawings that are important it's called the life and um, Leben im Wassertropfen and I don't have it here I'd have to jump up and get it but um, it's uh, basically uh, you buy it over Amazon and uh, essentially it is, uh, contains a lot of drawings and it contains the names of the organisms and a description in German. I say the language doesn't matter because um, you can use Google Translate by with your mobile phone. You just take a picture of the text and it, then it will translate into English. Uh, but the description is really not so important. I think what is more important is actually the name of the organism because once you've got the name uh, then you can go into Google, you type in that name, and then you actually get photographs. Yeah, so from the drawing, you get the name, and then you get a photograph over Google, and then you can actually compare it, whether it really matches that, what you have. Okay, so that's kind of the yeah um, the, the recommendation. The book is called Das Leben im Wassertropfen, for those of you who speak German. Um, as a matter of fact, if you go to my Amazon store, um, into the books section, I have it there as well. They've got also older editions which are green, but the new edition is, is white. It's called The Life in a Droplet of Water, and it's not cheap, the book. Okay? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I work at a company that does a lot of bacterial isolation. Identification is still very difficult, even with the most modern techniques. Yeah? Uh, this uh, sequencing results can be hard to interpret. Yeah, and then um, essentially you get uh, the way that it works. Uh, I get an email with a sequencing from the DNA sequencing, and then essentially you type it in into the computer or you copy paste it, and then yeah, uh, sometimes you discover that that uh, some bases, some sequencing bases are not um, free of um, sometimes there's some ambiguity there. Then you have to talk to the guy in the lab again and to try to figure out because he could not identify some of the bases. Uh, it's, it's quite a, it's it's puzzle work in any case. Yeah. Thank you for your answer. I have just one more question about alcohol, Oliver. Does it weaken our immune system? Um, hmm. The, I'm afraid of saying yes or no, honestly. Um, the thing is, there are many... The, I'm not, a, let's put it this way, I'm, I've, I'm not a way, if you say does it weaken our immune system, the question would be does it impact on, does it impact on the production of antibodies of our immune system? This is kind of the way that I interpret the question, right? And I have to be honest with you, I don't know, okay? Um, generally, um, it's my thing is alcohol, like other substances, are poisons. Okay, you have to see it like that, and is it's a stress on the body, 
and uh, I think anything that's a stress on the body yeah, might not be good generally. Yeah? Whether there is a direct effect on the immune system, I'm not aware of this. Um, if there were, then there would be must be a very strong correlation between alcohol consumption and people getting infectious diseases. So for example, those people who drink more alcohol um, must have a higher um, chance of getting, let's say, the common cold or influenza or whatever. If there is a correlation like this, and I'm not aware of one, but I cannot, I don't know, right? And then essentially you could probably conclude that it has an impact possibly on the immune system, right? So if people who basically drink alcohol are more often sick with other diseases, then I can imagine that there might be a connection, okay? At least uh, the correlation, first you have a, yeah, you're establishing some kind of a correlation and then you can actually check whether it's the alcohol that has a direct impact here. Right, so this is um, yeah uh, something the, the the that I would the way that I would um, answer this question here. So let's move on a little bit um, here. Um, yes. Where where is my desk view again? So this was the question about the detergent. Yeah, similar. Do they have eyes and brain? Uh, very often this uh, question appears. Do microorganisms have eyes and brain and so on? And um, I was I always want to ask myself is uh, what's the deeper meaning of this question I mean you, yeah and, and I think the reason is is because some of those microorganisms like Paramecium bruseria and so on they seem appear they seem to behave or respond to environmental changes okay and the short answer is no they do not have eyes and they do not have a brain because eyes and brain require multiple cells many billions of cells and paramecia are single-celled protists. They are mainly of only one cell. So they do not have eyes and brain. However, are, can they respond to light? Oh, sure, why not? Um, I can imagine that maybe um, some of them might be able to respond to light, especially if they contain those green algae, right? Or moving towards light. Yeah? Chlamydomonas, uh, for example, uh, green algae is also single-celled, moves towards light. It's not a paramecium, but still single cell, right? So, but it, they do not have eyes in the way that we actually refer to as eyes, right? And br a brain requires, the concept of a brain actually implies that there are billions of nerve cells interacting with each other and forming a neural network. And this is something they def definitely do not have. Yeah? Still, they're able to respond to stimuli in the environment uh, because this is something that uh, all living things do in their own way, but this does not always require a brain. Okay, so this is a little bit something that uh, um, might uh, cause uh, some surprise a little bit that, that seemingly meaningful behavior in the environment um, I, uh, does not require brain. I'll give you an example, a very uh, one. Plants growing towards the sun. Okay, you, you grow some plants and they grow towards the sun. Okay, um, wow, they're, growing to, they're moving toward, growing towards the sun. Uh, do they have eyes? No, it, it, they're able to respond to the light differently. Yeah. How do they know that they have to, do they have a brain? Is it intelligent that they move? No, um, no, a sunflower that turns its flower towards the sun is not intelligent because it just happens like this, yeah? It, it, it's, it's, um, yeah it has to do something with the water pressure in the cells, yeah, being able to move, uh, yeah, um, the flower. Um, so what I'm trying to say here is, is that not all behavior that seems intelligent actually is intelligent in the way that we as humans understand intelligence. It's again one of those aspects where we have to be careful that we do not assign human qualities to non-human uh, living things. Yeah? So, um, yeah, yeah, so uh, very quickly, it's again one hour and 18 minutes, okay. Um, yeah, also here, could you compare the blood of a corona? This, I don't know, I've, I think I've received this already 10, 15, 20 times over the last couple of months. Uh, could you compare the blood of a corona vaccinated and unvaccinated person? Of, can you compare it? If I put it under the microscope, they would look the same. Because um, uh, people who are immunized against uh, certain viruses um, have the possibility to produce antibodies. And those antibodies um, are too small to be seen by a microscope. Okay, they are below the resolution limit, and um, so you can we, you, with a microscope you would not be able to see a difference here. Okay, um, that is uh, very very uh, yeah, clear um, in in that sense because uh, 
those antibodies are way too small. Okay. So yeah, uh, yeah. Maybe maybe another one here because I've got it here. Um, long working distance objectives. Look what I got here. I just want to show this to you. This is from my it's a 160 millimeter object. Uh, yeah, and it says here I don't know if you. LWDR, you cannot see it, unfortunately. I don't know if I'm uh, here. That that's better. Okay. Long working distance. I don't know what the C stands for. Okay, unfortunately. Achromatic objective, 20 times magnification. The PL does not stand for plan, it stands for positive low. It's a phase contrast objective. Numerical aperture 0 0.40, 160 millimeter standard. And look, uh, cover glass thickness of not 1.7 but 1.2. Phase contrast. If you look through in here, do you actually see the ring in here? That actually shows that this is a phase contrast objective. Okay, but uh, the question was about the long working distance objectives, the LWD, and those long working distance objectives uh, uh, basically allow you to look at. Now I have to refocus here. Okay. Yeah, so the distance, I don't know how high the distance is, how large it is, but uh, normally if an objective has to be that close, then with a long working distance objective, you're able to get an image uh, yeah, further away. And uh, sometimes you need this extra space if you're manipulating the specimen in, in some way. Yeah? So I, could, I can imagine maybe um, if you're using a so-called a micro manipulator, yeah, so these are basically, um, yeah, you have maybe a, a little a drop with uh, something in there and you've got your, yeah, without a cover glass maybe even you've got your, your objective up here and then you have, uh, you're able to kind of uh, control or pick up samples and, and uh, manipulate it using joysticks and uh, this micro manipulator. So I, I can imagine this is uh, how it could be used. The reason why I got this one because is I wanted to have a 20 times objective and the only one that I could get was this one. Yeah. But this was essentially the the question: Are they all plan objectives? I don't know about no, not necessarily. I guess I guess it depends on the on the type of objective, yeah. And I guess maybe the plan versions and non-plan versions um, uh, around, yeah. So this is uh, simply um, yeah, these are very special types of objectives that are actually not normally uh, uh, found, yeah. So, but people, um, yeah. What I'm going to do slowly now is maybe one last question. Okay. Uh, maybe I'll cover some of the other questions next time. <laughs> what will happen if one run out of tiny things <laughs> to look at? I don't know, tiny things seems to me maybe another yeah, a brand or so. But the idea actually he was is, is what happens if you don't know what to put under the microscope? Okay, because this was actually um, a question posed uh, um, when I uh, mentioned that essentially that sometimes uh, people when they put something under the microscope they keep on seeing the same things and they become bored right and uh, the thing is is um, what you do is is uh, you try to specialize more I think that that's at least what I'm doing right so if you um, feel bored of always seeing the same specimens and you know it's again a rotifer or it's again some kind of I don't know a, a water crustacean or again some kind of paramecium then essentially what you can do is, is you can actually become a little more specific and say okay which type is it or which species is it and then you actually can try to identify and then you're going to discover that actually there is much more there than you've actually uh, thought at the beginning yeah? so you, if you really want to get specialized on, on this you can maybe try to hunt down very rare um, uh, specimens as well those that are not uh, commonly uh, or as commonly found yeah? so um, it depends a little bit on, on, on also where your interests are um, you can start collecting slides uh, buying slides um, maybe even antique slides that are out there some of them are not that cheap even because people collect them yeah? so there are uh, my um, suggestion is is there are many things to do. Many people will try to immediately upgrade the microscope. I have to say that the uh, ability to upgrade is a little bit limited in many cases with microscopes. They get a new microscope and they immediately say, okay, where can I buy new objectives or better objectives? And I'm saying, yeah, mm, the difference is probably not going to be so much. So maybe it's, an, it's a good idea to, to 
simply try to make yourself some projects maybe you want to make picture collections of, of, of whatever you find under the microscope um, yeah or videos YouTube channel is, is always a nice thing to do to share your to share your your observations yeah? so this is something that I would uh, uh, would, would say okay okay people uh, it's almost again one and a half hours okay I hope I did not overlook any relevant questions in the chat um, yeah, there, just a second. Uh, uh, yeah, I got some more comments here. Yeah. So yeah, I hope that uh, that you liked. In any case, I hope that you liked this stream. Unless um, unless I've got an unexpected appointment, um, I will basically keep on doing the live streams on on Saturdays at um, uh, nine thirty in the evening Central European time. Um, there will always be a couple of hours before that uh, there will always be um, I'll put the, an announcement online if uh, for whatever reason I'm not able to 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 do a live stream uh, sometimes I'll be able to move it to, to the next day to Sunday uh, but do check the, the the community posts in in this YouTube channel um, if you are uh, interested more in the technology part in the hardware part I have a second microscope uh, microscopy channel called microbe hunter microscopy links should be somewhere um, and I'm, I've been doing microscope reviews there and answering also more the technical questions as well okay um, so you might also want to check out the, that channel as well and uh, yeah if you also want to have a look at uh, at uh, some of the YouTube shorts that I started to make recently yeah and by the way I am going to announce another thing I'm working right now also on another video um, it was a little bit busy the last couple of days so I did not have so much time on it but I'm going to um, also wants to answer some biology questions a little bit for example this big question that was uh, in the media a couple of uh, months ago is, is do you have to put ketchup under the into the refrigerator or not heated debate in social media okay some said no you don't some people said yes okay the answer is well it depends okay and I'll be answering this question as well so I'm working on that video so stay tuned and it will be uploaded maybe in a couple of days um, on this on this channel here as well yeah, should you put ketchup under the microscope okay but uh, so for for right now um, yeah I think I'm, I'm just gonna leave it at that um, you see if you make you make uh, these live streams uh, also much easier for me by by posting questions of course thank you very much uh, for those as well um, so even if I'm not always responding uh, to them um, in the chat uh, not in the chat in the in the comments yeah at least I'm going I'm collecting them and I would like to answer them also in these live streams here okay I think I'm going to leave it at now really um, and I'm gonna put the little water critter here back also into <laughs> into the jar happy micro hunting as always and uh, of course see you around next time bye bye